That rudder piece, I've always been intrigued with what he does with different hymns. They're always lovely, thank you. All kinds of things for you this morning. One thing I want to let you know is that 30 of our members are up at family camp. Do you have that photo? They sent us a picture to prove it. There they are. So lots of them up there and it's really fun. It makes for quiet time over at children's camp, uh, children's table with only with the kids all up at camp, but it looks like they're having a great time despite the weather. And Larissa checked in and told us it was good. So they're having fun up there. Want to let you know that after worship today up in 206, I'll be leading a class talking, of, not class really, more of an organizational session, let's call it that about United Methodist classes and bands and what those are and how we might get something going around that here in the church. So if you're interested, um, join me upstairs for that after church. August 19th, I keep thinking, we don't talk about things that far in advance, but August 19th is not very far at all. August 19th in the Barker Hall will be showing the movie Lilo and Stitch, and the reason we're showing it inside instead of outside this time is so we can start early enough that children can attend. So at 6 p.m. on the 19th, we'll be having Lilo and Stitch, and um, but you're all invited. It'll be fun, and I'll be preaching on that one on the 20th. The 20th will be our outdoor service for August instead of the 13th, uh, for lots of reasons, mainly piano related because we've got all kinds of amazing music on the 13th. We've got some Gershwin stuff, and I don't know, our, our keyboardists, they want to use the real piano. And then um, on the 27th, we've got Mozart, and again, so, and just for lots of reasons. But anyway, so the 20th will be outdoors, but this Sunday, we're, no, next Sunday, next Sunday after church, they're gonna rehearse the ukulele band, and I've heard some people say it's a little hard, but it's not. It's not. It's We've got a couple of young kids with us who can play perhaps one or two chords. And so if you're feeling that you just want to play one or two chords, come join us after service on the 13th and, and it'll, it'll be great fun. However many chords you can get in there, it'll be great. No stress, no worries. Let's just have fun together. I'm playing zero chords. <laughs> also on the 20th, we, are ha we want you to wear your best Aloha attire. We have been We've learned, been learned, we've been educated, that's the word. You should be able to say we've been educated if you're talking about education. Um, that, so I've been saying wear your best Hawaiian shirt, Hawaiian garb, and Pua said it's aloha attire. So now we know. So hopefully on the 20th, we'll all be decked out in our best aloha attire. Sarah, let's have a call to worship. Or a statement of faith, I guess, today. Yes. All right, this morning, if you would kindly stand as you are able as we affirm our faith together in unison. We are not alone. We live in God's world. We believe in God, who has created and is creating, who has come in Jesus, the Word made flesh, to reconcile and make new, who works in us and others, by the Spirit. We trust in God. We are called to be the church, to celebrate God's presence, to love and serve others, to seek justice and resist evil, to proclaim Jesus, crucified and risen, our judge and our hope. In life, in death, in life beyond death, God is with us. 
We are not alone. Thanks be to God. Amen. Is that okay? Can you help me anyway? A little bit? I bet you can. If you don't want to help me, that's fine too. But because they can all help us, can't they? So I brought something to show you. Do you know what this thing is? No. This is a cup. And, and I brought this cup to see what we do with it. What do we do with a cup? What do we do with a cup? I thought maybe it would make a nice hat. Do you think? Let's see how it look on you. Oh, that's so good! That would be bad, wouldn't it? <laughs> it's a little small. Then I thought maybe with this, we could use it to cover our flowers from the bright lights. 
Then I thought, no, that, that seems silly. Then I thought if I had two, oh, I could just do one. I could use it for a percussion. Could we do, could do that, couldn't we? We could. But really, what's this cup for? For water, that's right. So all, there are all kinds of things in the world that have, one, have a purpose. If we could also put coffee. I don't like coffee, dear. Me either. <laughs> but we, you could put coffee in. But, so this is something to hold, something we can drink in, right? It's to put our drinks in, to have. It's not for hats. It's not for flower covers. It's just silly. But one of the things I wanted us to remember today is that this has a purpose. Purpose is kind of a big word. It means what we're supposed to do. And I wanted you to know and all of you to know that God has a purpose for every one of us. Do you think so? Mm -hmm. do you, what do you think God's purpose is for everybody? Do you have any idea? How about love everybody? That's a good one. How about be nice to everybody? How about take care of the earth? Good. That's very good. Well, so I just wanted us to think about what our purpose is because I think Brian later is going to help us understand that God has something for each of us to do. That's Brian. He's the one that makes music. Him and Elizabeth. And they do too. So you can, let's pray. Should we pray together? Dear God, Dear God. Thank you for our purpose. Thank you for our purpose. Take care of us. And show, us the way. and show us the way. We love you, God. Thanks for loving us. Amen. Thank you very much for helping me. Would you like to have this? You can color it. You can go, go play. about covenant and we remember that we are a covenant people that you invite us in in to a promise a promise that you will be with us that you will guide us and lead us a covenant we saw made long ago a covenant we saw fulfilled in your son remind us as that of that covenant as we move through our days as we celebrate as we celebrate children and their joy at being here and being involved as we celebrate those who are up at family camp and join fellowship and nature as we celebrate each person here remind us that we are a covenant people remind us this day as we know that there are those among us who are healing those of us who hurt or are worried that you are present for that is the covenant you have promised us that you know us, that you knew us before, and that you will know us as we continue into the days ahead. Be with us. And we ask that you would be with Brian this morning as he shares your word with the people gathered here. Be with us as we continue to worship, as we offer our gifts, as we learn and grow together. Amen. Our offertory is that famous hymn, O For a Thousand Tongues to Sing. But you remember last week and the week before, we did two different versions of it, and now we're doing the most modern version of it there is, which, is you'll, which you'll find in Worship and Song number 3001, or you can just sing along because the words, of course, will be on the screen. <laughs> 
into our future. Bless these gifts that we return to you. Amen. So sorry. The reading this morning is from Jeremiah 29, 10 to 14, from the, the message version. This is God's word on the subject. As soon as Babylon 70 years are up, and not a day before, I will show up and take care of you, as I promised, and bring you back home. I know what I'm doing. I have it all planned out. Plans to take care of you, not abandon you. Plans to give you the future you hope for. When you call on me, when you come and pray to me, I will listen. When you come looking for me, you will find me. Yes, when you get serious about finding me and want it more than anything else, I will make sure you won't be disappointed. God's decree. I'll turn things around for you. I'll bring you back from all the countries into which I drove you. God's decree. Bring you home to the place from which I sent you off into exile. You can count on it. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Sarah, for leading us in that scripture, and to both Chris and Sarah for helping me lead the singing today. Uh, this week is the conclusion of our three-week series on Methodism, specifically United Methodism. Dr. Kathy Kelsey spoke of two gifts provided by the early Methodist Church, the class meeting and the band meeting, of which you can find out more after service, as Stephanie mentioned, and their potential use in our church today. 
And Pastor Stephanie last week spoke to us about where the United Methodist Church is currently, giving us factual information about what is happening in the larger church. I'll speak today on some ideas I have on the future of the United Methodist Church. Our history and our future are tied together. One cannot speak of one, I think, without the other. We all know this, and Stephanie and I, early on in our planning, have acknowledged that there would be overlap between our three sermons. Many of Mountain View's services, and maybe even particularly today's worship, is a reflection of that overlap with traditional and contemporary music, traditional and contemporary liturgy, worship elements, and scripture, and even traditional and contemporary de decor. So, what happens now? We've lately learned a lot about the current state of the Methodist Church. I hear it's a bit messy. And we've been able to put that into some historical context. Where does that leave us? What do we need to do? Who do we need to be? Are we satisfied with this? I think now might be a good time to take stock of our inventory of holiness, our personal inventory, the churches and the larger Methodist church in the world. To be holy means to be set apart. Many would look to scripture to help us find answers, and I think we're still allowed to do that even with that um, bad journalism that we heard about last week. Uh, from Matthew and Peter and Luke and Corinthians and Leviticus and Deuteronomy, these things are holy. God. God's name, the angels, the temple, the law, the tithe, the Sabbath. But also, life lived abundantly, lived in wholeness and connected, fully alive in God, moving into deeper connection with God and our neighbor. These things that are holy are things that we, as a community and a church, hold dear. We have in the Methodist Church a structure, a method, to help us honor and learn more about holy things. Kevin Watson, in his 2015 article, The Methodist Band Meeting, Confession is for Protestants too. He states that early Methodists were interconnected by annual conferences, quarterly conferences, social meetings, class meetings, band meetings, love feasts, prayer meetings, select societies, select bands, and even penitent or con confessional type bands. Historians have often noted that the importance of conferencing is a fact in early Methodism. Methodists gathered together because they were convinced that growth in holiness is most likely to happen in community. In a few minutes, we'll celebrate communion, Holy Communion, that act of community that brings us and all the people of God together. Historians, sorry, we are social people. It is practically in our DNA to gather in groups, to learn from and to support each other. John Wesley spoke of social holiness. The term describes Wesley's understanding that holiness is love. This love is manifested in the pursuit of the good of others. It thus only exists in the contexts of relationships with other people. Love and hence holiness cannot be manifested in solitude. So, this gives us a framework, perhaps, for how we can move ahead in this messy world. We've all experienced messiness in our lives, at work, at home, with neighbors, our kids, our parents. Whenever people are involved, it gets messy. Finding ways to talk and listen is important to building community. The things we don't want to talk about or find it difficult to broach, these topics are often the ones that fester in our hearts. They fester in our community and as we've seen, the larger church. And when a topic or issue becomes unbearable, the breaking point often is not pretty. 
One thing I've been surprised about with regard to the current state of the United Methodist Church is how, it seems, one issue, one element of humanness has become for nearly 50 years the, the divisive, divisive issue in the church. Now, as a relative newcomer to our denomination, I'm surprised that there isn't more hubbub in the church and conference about, say, certain core theological issues or pastoral appointments or the formula for setting apportionments paid to the conference. I see the development of the Wesleyan Covenant Association and the Global Methodist Church as a response to how our denomination is embracing or deriding LGBT plus issues as the central issue regarding the current messy state of the Methodist Church. Sure, there have been times in history where Methodists have divided, then come together, then divided again. Bonnie Strand shared a book that her mother, Claire, owned called The Methodist Primer. Maybe you've heard of it or read it. I read it in an afternoon, and I learned how since 1729, when the first Methodist society occurred, we as a denomination have undergone great changes and strife. Early English opposition and persecution, our American Civil War, the growth of the Methodist Episcopal Church, the Methodist Episcopal Protestant Church, the Methodist Episcopal Church South, uniting conferences, disaffiliation, talks of reunification. Of course, not in the Methodist Church alone. People make things messy, but through it has been our connection to each other and, our, and an understanding that the love of God is all. Our individual theologies may differ, but our love of God and our desire to make a positive difference in the world cannot be denied. It is this love and grace that will help us to become the church that Wesley envisioned. John Wesley spoke much more about how we can work together and grow in God's love than he did about institutional breakups. When Mountain View went through the process of becoming a reconciling church, a two-year-long process of study and discernment, and ratified it in August of 2019, that was an amazing thing. By creating our welcoming statement, which is on the front page of our website and on the welcome table in the lobby, it showed our community and our conference that we have committed to the concepts of inclusiveness and diversity. Now this church wrote our welcoming statement, so this church says our welcoming statement together. Mountain View United Methodist Church is a community where we celebrate our differences and accept, affirm, and care for all. Your race, ethnicity, sexual orientation, gender identity, expression, relationship status, socioeconomic background, age, religion, body shape, size, and developmental and physical abilities are beautiful to us. We invite you to share and explore how faith can make us make our modern world a better place for every living creature. That's great, isn't it? I, for one, am proud to belong to a church that is so welcoming, inclusive, and inviting. It's interesting to think that if we did not have that welcoming statement, nor a pride flag in the narthex, would the newcomer be able to see that this church is indeed open, affirming, and reconciling? I think so. But perhaps there are more ways that we can make that a reality. But once a, de a declaration like this is made, it naturally will make some people unhappy. What if some person on Pearl Street Mall doesn't agree with this statement? Saying who we are might make some not want to be a part of us. It's been said before that sometimes we just can't include everyone. It's a painful thought. Saying we welcome everyone may make some people with different values 
feel disincluded. You know that for a week, um, our youth were in Florida. The kids may already have shared with you uh, some of the things they experienced at Youth 2023. We will hear a lot more about their trip and the things they learned and what was meaningful to them next week. But I'd like to share with you the excitement I felt when I read the organizer's post-event resource, which you can find online. Because of events like Youth 2023, our young people are being prepared to meet the challenges of the future, to think boldly by being and trusting themselves, to recognize their own power and boldly trust forward. Rachel Billups was the opening night main stage speaker, and she encouraged the youth by saying, God wants us to use our very best selves to transform the small thinking and brokenness of this world into resurrected life. Don't shrink back, don't quiet your voice, but in the name of Jesus, be bold. This kind of opportunity that Youth 2023 provides speaks well into building a strong base of thinking people who will confidently lead the church forward into new and holy places, fulfilling a vision, a vision of hope and love. To move forward together, we need vision. We need guidance. Some would say that little has been established with regard to a vision for the United Methodist Church. No guiding path for where we are headed. Kay Coton is a contributing author in a new book published last year entitled, What's Next? Edited by Kevin Slim. In her chapter, Kay poses several questions. Who is responsible for casting a vision to guide us into the next chapter of our future? Who would create the vision, vision's implementation plan and oversee it? Who would, where does that responsibility lie? And who's, who has the authority to implement that vision? Does it rest with the bishops, the connectional table? She says, and I quote, the complexity of our leadership structure in the United Methodist Church makes it challenging to understand and navigate where this type of critical and holy work would take place, let alone who is responsible and accountable. I think these questions pose great challenges for our current and future establishment, but I trust that the education and inspiration that young folks and potential leaders are receiving, our future shows great promise in being able to continue our mission of creating disciples and growing God's love on earth. I would like to remind us of what Pastor Stephanie said last week, that Wesley taught that schism is, about, is not about breaking an institution, rather it is breaking the spirit. A lot of us probably feel that our institution is broken or on the verge of becoming broken. But Dr. Scott Kisker of United Theological Seminary in Dayton, Ohio, in his recent essay entitled John Wesley, Methodism and Schism, provides a unique perspective. Our movement itself, he says, depends on schism, separation, and division for its very existence. That indeed has been our Methodist heritage since the mid 1700s. Perhaps we ought not to be afraid of people breaking away. I think that what happens at General Conference next summer will help us to solidify what Methodism as an institution will be. United Methodists from around the world will meet and pray and discern how our denomination should move forward. Decisions about who can be ordained, who can be married in the church, the creation of an American conference, what to do for those individuals who feel they have no church home because their church disaffiliated. To be sure, there will be many disagreements among the representatives, but I pray they remember Wesley's words that though we may not think alike, may we not love alike, may we not be of one heart even though we are not of one mind. 
I'm reminded of Dr. Kelsey's words two weeks ago that nobody's perfect. Do-overs are possible, and even perhaps reconciliation is possible when we are convinced that we are all loved by God. Although reunification may not be on the horizon, I cannot help but for a moment, but think that forgiveness, do-overs, and reconciliation of some sort won't be part of the process. To the congregations who've disaffiliated, our bishop, Reverend Dr. Karen Oliveto, has said, we'll keep the porch light on. Others, like Bishop Thomas Bickerton, president of the Council of Bishops, said, I'm eager to get past all this. I want us to stop talking about disaffiliations. I take that to mean that, for one, by God's grace and love, disaffiliation, disaffiliating congregation can come home if the Spirit moves them to do so. And for another, that surely there are other things in addition to the church's stance on LGBT issues that the church should concern itself with. For example, the spirit of the church. Is our spirit broken? Are we ready to throw in the towel? Would you be satisfied with that? For me, and I think many of you, the answer is a resounding no. And I feel that folks in this space would agree that there is work to be done. There is no time for towel throwing, much love to be shared, and great hope to be seen in the future. So what happens now? I think Victor Cyrus Franklin said it well on his t-shirt at Youth 2023, more living, less judging. I think between our disagreeing factions, it is dialogue. Being able to speak to each other in a safe place, a neutral place to start with, and then perhaps with mediation, but always with the understanding that we are all God's children and by God's grace, we are loved equally. This is how we can do it, with love and grace and hope. By understanding that our Wesleyan Church was about groups coming together, confessing their shortcomings, worshiping as community, loving God and following Jesus, studying scripture and caring for each other, we can acknowledge that our current messy state, but with confidence, will move forward. We see already the light of God shining throughout our world, in our denomination, our conference, our district, our church. The two questions I keep coming back to in preparing for this sermon were first, Kathy's question, are you satisfied? Hopefully the answer for each of us is no. We have God's work to do and love to be shared and understanding to be made manifest throughout our communities and the larger church. The other is Stephanie's son's girlfriend's grandmother's question. <laughs> what kind of Methodist are you? I think a good answer to that is what John Wesley encouraged, to be the kind of Methodists that do all the good we can, in all the ways we can, everywhere and whenever, and to all the people we can, as long as ever we can. The United Methodist Church and Mountain View United Methodist Church are moving forward in faith and hope. Thanks be to God. Amen. Thank you. What? Oh. Just real quick. Oh, I thought you were done. You'll, you'll find the musical responses for our communion liturgy in the faith we sing, number 2257. The words will also be on the screens. Pastor Stephanie. Sorry. You changed from preacher guy to music guy, and I didn't, I didn't transition. It's quite a transition. You'll find, yes, this is a sung response, so be ready to sing along. Um, Thank you, Brian. I appreciate your words as we think about where we go as a church. I invite you to join us in this communion liturgy.
right and a good and joyful thing, always and everywhere to give thanks to you, God Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. You formed us in your image and breathed into us the breath of life. When we turned away and our love failed, your love remained steadfast. You delivered us from captivity, made covenant to be our sovereign God, and spoke to us through the prophets. And so, with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord. Blessed is your Son, Jesus Christ. Your Spirit anointed him to preach good news to the poor, to proclaim release to the captives, and to recover the sight of the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, and to announce the time had come when you would save your people. He healed the sick, fed the hungry, and ate with sinners. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. When the Lord Jesus ascended, he promised to be with us always in the power of your word and spirit. On the night that he gathered the disciples for dinner, we know that he took bread and blessed it. Pour out your spirit on this to make it be for each of us your body. And he broke the bread and he offered it to each of them. When they had finished with the supper, he took the cup and again offered it. Pour out your spirit on this cup so that it would be for each person a reminder of that new covenant, and he offered it to each of them. And so in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the great mystery of faith. on each of us gathered in this place and on these gifts, the bread and the cup. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ, that may, we may be for the world the body of Christ. By your spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at the holy, heavenly banquet through your son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit in your holy church. All honor and glory is yours, almighty God, now and forever. Now, with the confidence of the children of God, let us join together in praying. Our Father, who art in heaven, 
hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Because there is one loaf, we who are many are one body, for we all partake of the one loaf. The bread which we break is a sharing of the body of Christ. The cup over which we give thanks is a sharing of the new covenant. I would invite you to come up the center aisle to receive communion and return to your seats from the outer aisle. And I would remind you that in the United Methodist Church, everyone is welcome at the table. You don't have to be a member of this church or any church. You just have to come, ready to be a part, to meet Jesus at the table.
Communion prayer. Eternal God, we give you thanks for this holy mystery in which you have given yourself to us. Grant that we may go into the world in the strength of your spirit to give ourselves for others. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. I invite you to stand as you are able to join in our closing hymn, Shine, Jesus, Shine. This is a song from, for some of us, when it came out, it was like, yes. So sing it with spirit. Sing it with people who are excited to say we are moving forward as a church. And there, if you are one that learned the fire, fire, fire part, feel free to shout it out. <laughs> I probably will. Thank you.